Unit 23, checking out disturbance at Kong Studios. Over. <laughs> Once upon a time, the Earth was ruled by manufactured pop and chaos reigned. From the chaos came gorillas. Four intrepid heroes, united as one, came to save us all. 2D, enigmatic frontman, voice like an angel, backside like a satsuma. And now I know done what we had done before. And also I'm going to sing in. Noodle, ten-year-old Asian axe princess who arrived in a crate. From the first moment the four of us played together, it was apparent that the combination of ingredients were correct. Russell, drummer, hip-hop, hard man, host to Delve the spirit rapper. I think we just assembled our influences and qualities in a certain combination that appealed to people. People just like what we did because it's good. Murdoch, self style leader and Svengali mouthpiece. You know, we, we had our whole battle plan together you know, and we had it down. You know, it was drawn up with military precision. Though, if you really ask me to pin it down to a single solitary reason, I would probably have to say it was because of the watertight deal I made with Satan. The Elzebub himself. It's important to have clean, shiny shoes as well, if possible. Nice, clean, shiny shoes. Together, they are gorillas. <laughs> Not satisfied with chart domination alone, the world's first virtual band decided to meet the masses and began to play live. Here, the Grimmers played two headline gigs at once, lasting out in Paris, the other the virtual Glastonbury Festival on the World Wide Web. Followed this with the headline tour of the UK and North America in September 2001, along with another hit single from the album Rock the House. February, Gorillas were nominated for an astounding six Brit Awards. That's every category in which they were eligible. Their incredible performance of the awards ceremony stole the show. In the two years since its release, sales of the Gorillaz album have hit gold status in 19 countries, platinum status in a further 8 countries, and double platinum status in a further 3 countries. Total Gorillaz album sales are approaching an amazing 5 million copies across the globe. So is this the end of the story for Gorillaz? No! It's not the end, it's just the beginning! Give us a light, mate. You can't smoke in here. Yes, I can. Watch. <laughs> Well, you know, after, after the American tour, which ended in March 2002, we sort of came back to England and wrote some new songs, but, you know, frankly, we were cream crackered, you know, knackered. We played our last date together as a band at the Isle of MTV show in Portugal around, when was it? Uh, it was June 2002, you know. and that was it. And after that, we just concentrated on trying to make this sort of turdy gorillas film. Yeah, well, we got so many offers to make a film in America. At the time, it seemed like a waste not to take the opportunity. <laughs> We, 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 we pretend to let the telly 
So, we all move over to LA for a while, you know, la la land. And uh, we sort of hired this big house out in the sort of, kind of uh, like a Hollywood thing, you know, it's like up in the hills, you know. So that we can sort of, you know, sort of be right in the hub, you know what I'm saying? In the hub of, of where we were sort of meant to be filming. But I've got to say, you know, man, there was a lot of great distractions. And you know what I mean? <laughs> I know you like that. You want to try that. The film negotiations were just endless. Oh, man, I was just like really, really tedious. Yeah, we got caught up in rehearsals, meetings, script approvals. The script was unfinished. The people writing it thought they were making a very insightful yet ironic comment on popular culture. A supposedly non-linear Charlie Kaufman-esque animation in which the four main protagonists, namely gorillas, fall randomly in and out of a number of surreal situations. But in fact, the script writers were just like, um, making it up as they went along. Um, will you wake us up when you finish, Noodle? <laughs> I guess what she's trying to say is they thought it was going to be like a modern version of the monkey's movie, Head. Yeah, yeah, the thing is, though, the, the person they chose to play me looked like some old wrinkly geriatric, you know? It's really insulting. I, I think it might have been Robert Downey Sr. <laughs> I mean, that guy must have been pushing 70, you know? Anyhow, the situation went downhill from there. No one was focused enough. Judy couldn't understand the difference between film and reality. Murdoch got himself kicked out of the Playboy mansions for stealing ashtrays. And Russell got a big fat ego and then changed his name to R. Diddy. So eventually we decided to cut our losses and take time off to recuperate. This just lead to further misadventure. So, you know, man, you know, when we realized we were just sort of whistling in the wind, we decided to have a break from each other. I stayed around in Los Angeles for a while. I got invited to stay around Britt Eklund's flat. But, you know, she's nuts. Running around naked, banging on the walls half the night. I never got any sleep. So I nod off back to my dad's place on the coast of England. I got a temporary job like work on the rise at my old man's like fun fair, which was wicked really. It did a lot for my confidence, yeah? I put up with a lot less crap than that geriatric Murdoch now. Oi, you, pass us the ashtray, now! Yeah, certainly, sir, you go. Russell spent a long time trying to recuperate. He ended up living in Ike Turner's basement. Ike Turner! You went a wee bit mental, didn't you, Russ? Well, he certainly looked a lot like Ike Turner. I was working on an album of my own, but eventually it felt like the album was working on me. It was a strange time. When you work in a band with people for such a long period, and then that suddenly stops, it can leave you at a loss. I think I had some kind of breakdown. I just lost one of my closest friends, Dale, the spirit who used to live inside me. And the strain was starting to show. Mm. Every song I tried to record would become a hallucination. Then the hallucination would try to write the song. Which would then get up and become yeah, 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 another yeah, 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 Russell, Russell, man. It's probably, it's what? probably. No, no. I'm sorry. No, it's man. It's all right. I'm it's sorry. Like, take it easy, man. It's yeah. Dark place, man. Dark place. Mm. The album has a fuller breadth of vision this time round. Stylistically, it's richer, denser, darker. It also reflects a little of the uh, mental state that we found ourselves in. I speak for myself here. The album opens with an ominous swirling sandscape of voodoo-esque percussion, keyboard bassoons and sirens. You can tell there's big trouble ahead. This uses a sample taken from the Georgie Romero film, A Dawn of the Dead. We use this because it expressed a similar sense of foreboding about the world that we feel at this time too. 
that there's a sense that people in some certain quarters are working on motorized instinct as I'm thinking automatons rather than with any genuine humanity, uh, sensitivity or understanding of the consequences of their actions. No, I thought we used it because I like the zombie films, yeah? It's a wicked bit, right, when the zombies tear off the biker's arm, yeah? Yeah, and yeah, well, whatever, you know. It's, it's from some stupid zombie flick and we, we thought it set the rest of the album up quite well. So, anyway, I headed down south to try my luck in Mexico, yeah, Mexico, yeah. yeah there was some sort of mix-up, you know, my finances, and I, I, I kind of got yeah, accused yeah, of them. Um, yeah, yeah, he was found using counterfeit checks in a Mexican brothel. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the chicken choker. Mm, wonderful place and fantastic staff. Eh? Happy days. <laughs> Basically, he got caught passing dud checks off as payment to the girls. And consequently, Murdoch got taken to jail. Yeah, yeah, well, all right, Russell. <laughs> Anyway, after 18 months in this sort of Tijuana jail, I thought, enough is enough. And with a little hell from my veins, I got myself sort of out. Blighty. Back home to Blighty, the good old U of the K. But I tell you, that's enough South America for me for a while. You know, the, the prison food yeah, is rubbish. I, I, I don't think I could eat another burrito in my life. Yeah, but you still like a bit of Mexican sausage, eh, man? <laughs> Shut up, you little fu- This is the most punk rock sounding track on the album. A real pumping powerhouse. The drums really motor along. It's relentless. The guitar line on this track is played by one of the Mexican inmates that Murdoch brought back with him after his time in jail. They helped him escape. Now Murdoch owns them. Yeah, well, I mean, they're both good guys when you get to know them. A part of Murdoch's payment was to allow him to appear on the new Gorillaz album. Hence the slightly, uh, drunken nature of the guitar player. Alcohol is one of the ways we suppress our indecisions. Yeah, certainly one of the better ones, love. Beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. Sorry, um, did, did you pick that up? This song is about the relentless fury of alcohol, the focus drive and the singular thirst that that kind of desire creates. Uh, one man's passion is another man's addiction. Oh yeah, some drunk tramp did the vocal for this song. You know, the white light bit. He sang it into a dictaphone for us one morning when he was slumped in the heat down by the canal. Uh, sorry, did you just call me a tramp? You better watch your lips, sonny. Hmm. By the time I got back, her noodle had also returned from her trip to her Japanese homeland and was already in the process of recording a new album, or, you know, at least laying down a lot of the groundwork. Yes, uh, I had been in Japan for about a year, uh, researching my past as it had always been a, a mystery to me. <laughs> during this period that uh, I was awoken from my extended amnesia and in doing so I discovered many interesting facts about myself uh, one of which is that I knew English language fluently <laughs> having been revitalized I returned to England and I began to lay foundation for a new Gorillaz album However, Kong Studios, uh, where we live and record, had been lined dormant and empty during our absence. Oh, uh, yeah, you know, it's hard to get good staff to clean a haunted studio. Yes, no one had maintained the building and it had also been broken into. There seemed to be a, a plague of the walking undead infesting the building. Corpses lined the corridors. Noodle started working on the initial sketches of the album while we were all still kind of preoccupied, you know. Lucky for her, I, I, I'd left a very specific set of instructions as to how the new song should, you know, sound. That, that was just a, a tape of you humming. Yeah, cha. Actually, Noodle wrote most of the album herself. Murder may try to take the credit for it, but from the basic sketches to the finished album, this was Noodle's vision. 
This is Murdoch. You're checking out. Fire's coming out of the monkey's head. Radio 1. Oh. If you having girl problems, I feel bad for you, son. I got 99 pounds, but a chain one. Hit me. It was around then that I had uh, of DJ Danger Mouse. Uh, I was impressed with the work he had done on his own grey album, which he had spliced together the work of the Beatles and Jay-Z to create something new. Um, it was wonderfully inventive and showed a childlike uh, creativity, um, artistic bravery and disregard for convention that I thought suited Koilas. So I contacted him. Then what happened? Well, it took a while to convince him to work with Gorillaz. No, well, he, he wasn't overly keen on leaving sunny LA to, to go and work in a rundown haunted studio in rain sodden Essex. Although, I can't think why. Me neither. I originally discovered the building, which now houses Kong Studios, back in 1999. I was looking for a cheap studio space on the internet, and it threw up this little gem. It's located on a hilltop in, in Essex, and believe me, there aren't many hills in Essex. Mm, there's one in Langdon, I think. Mm. But it, it wasn't until we'd sort of been there for a year or so that we discovered the truth about the place. It turns out the original site for the building was like a druid's meeting point. It was picked specially for its unique alignment of dark energies and hideous ley lines. The first Kong building was erected on top of an old disused cemetery. A lot of people who died in the Great Plague of 1665 were dumped there in shallow graves and burial pits. Poor people. Yeah. Poor people. I mean, the, the last owners were this kind of biker gang. <laughs> you know, these cats who used, used to use the building as their clubhouse. And they called they what are they, what are they called? Oh yeah, yeah, they're called the nomads. They'd chosen to settle there for some reason. Anyway, one night they all got caught in a fire in the building. Yeah. <laughs> Burnt her crisp. <laughs> Holding out of aeroplanes and hiding out in holes. Waiting for the sunset to come, people going home. Jump that from behind them and shoot them in the head. Now everybody dancing, the dance of the dead. The dance of the dead. The dance of the dead. Tale on this track is narrated by Mr. Dennis Harper. Noon ran into him at some award show, and it turns out he knew some girl his tracks already. We told him what we were working on, and he took it from there. In time, the strange folk found their way into the higher reaches of the mountain, and it was there that they found the caves of unimaginable sincerity and beauty. By chance, they stumbled upon the place where all good souls come to rest. The backdrop to his classic Easy Rider film was an America in transition period after the ravages of the Vietnam War. And filmed in an age in which people were questioning the wisdom of their political system. What the hell's wrong with freedom, then? That's what it's all about. He seemed like an astute choice to feature on this track. Yeah, and, it, and he was great in speed as well. Meanwhile, down in the town, the happy folks slept restlessly, their dreams invaded by shadowy figures digging away at their souls. This little parable that Dennis narrates is a short story that Noodle wrote in the style of Herman Hess, a childlike fable of a people too good-hearted to see the steady influx of other people with the... Uh, a darker agenda. Yes, uh, both groups, uh, ignorant to the position of the other, will clash. Uh, this result in a, a devastating loss for all, in which no one won. And there came a sound, distant first, that grew under castrophony, so immense that it could be heard far away in space. There were no screams. There was no time. The mountain called Monkey had spoken. There was only fire, and then nothing. I sold Dennis my old Winnebago while he was down at Kong, you know, so I sort of said I'd knock a bit off the price if he gave us the vocal. <laughs> Mr. Mouse 
Mouse and myself immediately began an intricate pre-production session. He's, a, he's an odd-looking fellow, you know, that Danger Mouse. He's got like this, you know, sort of, sort of like a huge hair, you know. No, I, I mean really, really big hair. <laughs> He, he looks a little bit like that David Blaine cat. You know, oh, with, with, with a wig, mm, mm. like he's got a wig on. This track, Feel Good Inc., was chosen to be the first single from the album. We thought it would be an upbeat and dynamic return. Part Billie Jean, part Rockwell. To be honest, it's as infectious as influenza. We asked our friends De La Soul to lend a rap to the song. So they came over to the studio and hung out for the day. In the evening, they delivered this crazy, golden, fun rap. Yeah, sounds like a bunch of kids trapped in a photo booth. Some people contacted us, uh, some we contacted ourselves, and some were already friends of the band. Uh, Danger Mouse came with um, his own network of people. It's always encouraging to meet people we respect and find out that they're already Gorilla's fans too. It's there. Oh. Sean Ryder appears on the track Dare. Yeah, well, you know, he's an old friend of mine. A fellow ornithologist. What's an ornithologist? A bird watcher. This is a hefty track. This track went through many manifestations before finally settling itself in this form. A, a big shiny gorilla tune. It's Dare! It's Dare! Sean Ryder was the singer of the Happy Mondays, a huge influence on so many people. You can tell he's an original because he spawned so many imitators. Not just musically, but in his lifestyle and the way he spoke. Balls. When he came into the studio, he was like, Oh, I say, what time's tea then? Um, do I have time to lay down? some of my singing before we retire to the drawing room. Marvellous. Suva. All that Manx street tour is just a big put on for the cameras. Sean's really just a big posh kid. This is 2D from Gorillaz and you're checking out Fire's Coming Out of a Monkey's Head on Radio 1. Right back down to earth on this track. The beginning sounds like an old wham record. This features a rap supplied by London born rapper MF Doom. Crank it on blast, old past front street. Blew the whole spot like some old ass with skunk meat. These kids is too fast, juiced off a junk tree. Who could get looser off a crunk or a funk beat? Something is starting today. Where did he go? Why you wanted to be where you know November has come? MF Doom has rapped under several different identities. He started out as Zev Love, the mastermind of KMD. He's also released a couple of albums as MM Food. He appears on his track as MF Doom. MF stands for Metal Face, and the Doom bit is uh, in part a tribute to the Marvel Comics supervillain Dr. D. The Iron Enemy of the Fantastic Four. This is a more down tempo track, like nighttime maneuvers, the equivalent of creeping up on the enemy. Hey, and as a progression of the album's narrative, there is a sense of being forced into a, a position of having to arm your children. Kids with guns, kids with guns, take care of her. I won't be long. The arms are ambiguous, but there is a definite sense of conflict on the way. Desensitize yourself before you get taken advantage of. Uh, they are turning us into monsters. It's an expression of the transition of training people how to lose their compassion. It's a jungle out there. Yeah, sometimes it makes me wonder how I keep from going under. track features a guest vocal from Nina Cherry. I loved her Raw Like Sushi Bigo album. She's always had a positive collaborative attitude towards music. 
Seven seconds with you on door is a superlative tune. Seven seconds away, just as long as I stay. Yes, and towards the outro, there is a moment of subdued tension that then allows itself to explode into space, and then the track soars off into the distance. The restraint in the earlier section of the song is actually what gives it the power at the end. So, and the key is maybe in the word a uh, pacify. You know. If I have to die, I want to go in my sleep like my dad. Not screaming and like yelling like all his passengers. All alone. This is a massive swinging, bouncing hip hop track featuring a machine gunning rap from London's own Roots Maneuver. Roots' vocal just kind of dances between the huge rolling circular beat. Yeah, like a boxer filled up with brandy. Roots Maneuver has been dropping by Kong Studios on and off since we started. It would be a limitation to say that Roots Maneuver is at the forefront of UK hip hop as a rapper. He's at the forefront of hip hop, full stop. The additional vocals came courtesy of Martina Topley Bird. Close your eyes and see. Her vocal is so light, warm, and sweet. It provides the release in this case. Come and save the Oh yeah, gorillas on the road. Oh yeah. Hey, 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 you ain't a real band until you've earned your stripes. Gorillas live, you know, it's like a full-on juggernaut. And I need servicing every 200 miles, baby. That's because you clapped too. We would love to tour this album, but visually it would need to match the ambition and tone of the album. We wouldn't tour again in the same format that we did for the last album. Everyone gets a little excited when something special rolls into town. And I guess a 50-foot cartoon freak show is no exception. To create a real jaw-dropping experience, we're currently in the process of developing some pretty high-tech technology to make screens walk on stilts and drink fire. Yes, this is very difficult to do. Yeah, especially if you like play instruments and sing at the same time. <laughs> As a body of work, Demon Days is more focused and considered than the first album. Maybe it has a greater gravity to it than the first record, when we were still kind of learning the ropes. The music has a stricter discipline to it, with an undercurrent of dark optimism. I mean, it's still heavy on the bass, but less dub, more hip hop. A rapper, bug zapper, and it don't matter after if things are thug or dapper. No to what these tubers do is you and who and you know where. But it also contains a lot of old England pastoral soul, humanist sonics, if that makes sense. Um, not really. <laughs> Hello? Hey Murdoch, 
Es el bandido Pedro. Ah, oh, sí. I want my money. If I don't get my money, I'm gonna take you and your gorillas and stick them down the toilet. I'm gonna grab your cajones. I kill you. I burn your house to the ground. Don't mess with me. I'm a bandido. Listen, Pedro, you little bugger. I'll bring your sodding taco back as soon as I finish this interview. Ciao, mate. Have a nice day. Who is that? No one. Wrong number. So, any more questions? No? Great. Right. I'm off down the pub. Anyone coming? Last one to the bars. I want...